Okay, welcome everyone to the Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration panel discussion. Thank you for joining us both in person and online. I'm Bryony Roberts, I teach here at Columbia GSAP in the architecture program and I'll be moderating this event. This event is co-presented by the Barnard Center for Research on Women or BCRW and Columbia GSAP. And it's wonderful that these two institutions are coming together to support a conversation about experiences of gender and sexuality in the built environment. And hopefully there'll be many more such conversations to come. We're grateful to Dean Haka of GSAB for including this event as part of the Dean's Lecture Series and to the co-directors of the BCRW, Pramila Nadison and Janet Jacobson for their support of this event. We'd also like to thank A.V. Cummings, Professors Beck, Jordan Young, and Karen Fairbanks at Barnard for their support, and Stefan Bodeker, Shannon Wuerl, and Lucy Kresbach at GSAP for their help in making this event possible. I'll shortly hand it over to Anurada Ayer Siddiqui, who will be introducing our wonderful speakers and respondents. Anurada organized this event and co-edited, along with Rachel Lee, the series of scholarly essays on feminist architectural histories of migration that we'll be celebrating tonight. Anurada is an assistant professor of architecture at Barnard and is also affiliated with the Barnard Department of Art History and several departments at Columbia <laughs> University, the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society, the Institute of African Studies, South Asia Institute, and GSAB. She's modestly asked me to keep her bio brief, but I will just say that through her work as a scholar and educator, Anurada is profoundly expanding histories of the built environment. In addressing themes of migration, she destabilizes the subject matter of architectural history and transforms the process of writing history into a co-creative experience of care. This editorial project with Rachel Lee is a remarkable work of scholarship and of cross-border community building. Growing from the lineages of intersectional and decolonial feminisms, this project further challenges the fixity of ideas of subjecthood, statehood, authorship, and architecture and in doing so, builds radically collaborative methods of writing histories. Please join me in welcoming Anurada Ayer Siddiqui. Thanks so much, Bryony. How is the sound? Is it OK? I'm talking into the microphone? Great. So welcome to the launch of our collection, Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration. Um, I, too, want to echo Bryony's thanks to the organizers, many organizers. Um, and um, really, I have the honor of serving on the BCRW Advisory Board. And I very much hope that um, this is the first of many collaborations with colleagues concerned with architecture, the built environment, spatial practices, and their histories. Um, we're so very grateful. Um, I'll speak for myself and my co-editor, Rachel Lee, and also our authors. Um, to our respondents and moderators, Bryony Roberts, Atia Korakivala, and the GSAP X Plus students whose vision brought us here. Um, Anais Haltermeyer, Rebecca Siqueiros, and Sofia Strabo. So my co-editor, Rachel Lee, um, is unable to join us, but she's here in spirit. So please imagine her hovering around and saying something hilarious and inappropriate, which is what she's best at. Um, <laughs> And it's really my pleasure to launch a series of essays and scholarly articles that concern migration as a method for understanding histories of the built environment. If we imagine architecture as something fixed, we do so because its histories are written in large part without questioning the fixity and landed wealth of archives. The articles and essays in this collection instead imagine the past and the future with the migrant and construct narratives of people and things whose migrations form the, base, the basis of understanding environments or whose environments leave traces of migrations. Authors in this collection and their narratives are located all over the world providing deeply situated histories which, when read together, form connected global histories. The articles and the essays um, in this collection were published in installments over the past three years there were three installments in three online platforms, and you see the front pages of each of those on the screen here. Um, they also show a progression of theory on a theory of margins, a theory of diffractions, and a theory of collaborations. The feminist qualifier is an analytic that emerged in understanding the margins, 
diffractions, and collaborations of migrant histories. Rachel and I found ourselves understanding that by following migrants and migrations, we were necessarily coming into a, pro a kind of provincialization of those landed and fixed histories of architecture. And that provincialization is the norm of the normative archive is perhaps the first step in writing feminist histories. We found ourselves articulating histories of migration by following architectures and figures from the perspective of the margins through diffractions and in collaborations, an important prog progression for feminist theorizations. We thought we would test ways of scaffolding this work that lacked its own edifices, um, understanding the ephemerality of digital platforms for scholarship, we worked with the metaphor they offer to underscore the problem and themes at hand. So we're very grateful to the editors of three digital platforms, the scholarly peer-reviewed platform ABE, Architecture Beyond Europe. Um, you see the page on the very right. Um, that publication was, um, the publication date is 2019, but it was launched in 2020 thanks to editors Tanya Sengupta, Johan Lage, and Ricardo Agares. Um, second, the visual and oral platform, the Canadian Center for Architecture, um, they released essays one by one in 2020 and 2021, um, thanks to editors Alexandra Pereira Edwards and Albert Ferre. And finally, the scholarly and theoretically minded platform Aggregate, uh, which uh, launched the remainder of the collection in 2022. And uh, we'd like to thank editors Meredith Ten Hoor, Pamela Karimi, and Elliot Stuart Vaunt. Thanks to all these editors, this is a collection of uniformly excellent research and writing, magical narratives, and entirely new approaches to seeing and storytelling. And you'll get to hear from some of those authors tonight. You know, releasing the collection over these three years, uh, while in effect of the practical problem of editing and, pub and production, it allowed us to make time our accomplice, um, to conscript into the process of publication forms of waiting and anticipation that are akin to the process of reading and allowed us to build the pathway from margins through diffractions into collaborations in solidarity with many authors. Rachel and I worked on migration long before the pandemic, but it's been meaningful to see these publications marking the first few years of the pandemic when the questions within them have been brought to the forefront. These questions of how to write anti-patriarchal, anti-racist, anti-castist, and anti-formalist architectural histories in historiographical solidarity with people in the past and present who've been deterritorialized and dispossessed of land and home this has been a project of writing intersectional histories, and we follow many thinkers, such as Audre Lorde or Bell Hooks, who argue that there is no feminism without intersections. We find our feminist architectural histories of migration in the protests of Shaheen Bagh, the fishing villages of Nigeria, spaces of sex work at military bases in the Philippines, construction projects in Haiti and Brasilia, spaces of care in Cape Town's Somali malls, birthing clinics at the Mexico-US border, a dining table in Ticino, Switzerland, the work of Silvia Federici, Simone de Beauvoir, and Gloria Ansaldua, perambulations in Harlem and Delhi, Hong Kong's offices and classrooms, Barcelona's Manzanas, apartments in Vienna and Istanbul, the rooftops of Tehran, and the nail houses of Shenzhen. We follow builders, refugees, dissidents, exiles, and even architects, thinking with and assessing the work and migrations of Cheng Yingxi, Sibyl Molinage, Georgette Cotenuziol, Mar Margreta Shutelihotsky, Perrin Mistri, Minette de Silva, Susanna Antona Kakis, Lina Bobardi, Flora Rushat Roncati. And to better explain these stories and the collection as a whole, I'd like to present it through one of the edifices that we attempted to create to house and grow the work. Rachel and I invited the readers listed here on the left side of the screen uh, to select excerpts from articles that we assigned to them and film themselves reading them aloud in solidarity with this project. So we're very grateful to Will Davis, one of the authors who edited a video 
in a format that articulates the connections between authors, histories, readers, and wider audiences around the world. We're also very grateful to these careful, critical readers for producing a citational scaffold around this work. So I urge you to watch the full video to gain a sense of the collection, and I'm gonna show you some excerpts tonight to explain the thrust of the three dossiers and give you a sense of some of the articles. Hello everyone, my name is Esther Akca and I'm reading an excerpt from On Margins, Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration, written by Anu Siddiqui and Rachel Lee. Since 2015, there has been an upsurge in scholarly interventions that engage with migration and exile. The crisis perceived in Europe has impacted European traditions of architectural history, architecture, culture, and discourse. Thus, the writing on architecture and the built environment resulting from this turn has tended to focus on contemporary displacement related to cities, landscape, and social fabric in Europe. These have broadly drawn from a Eurocentric perspective of border transgression, rather than taking migration as an ontological condition to be understood from the migrant's perspective. In contrast, the essays in this themed section and related contributions in this issue of Architecture Beyond Europe examine a longer time frame and wider geographical scope in order to consider architecture and migration historically. While most recent spatial studies of migration and exile are rooted in the social sciences, the essays here suggest a humanities approach that can open up wider historical debates to encompass the territorial, economic, and geopolitical aspects of migration, as well as those of material culture, ecologies, and labor. Thank you, and congratulations to the editors. My name is Joy Boya, and I'll read an excerpt from the piece titled Convivium, Flora Rusharonkati's Practice, and it's by Irina Davidovich and Katrin Albrecht. Embedding her professional and teaching practices in the most productive social rituals led not only to a strengthening of her connections, but eventually her own professional empowerment. However, feeding people was not a strategic choice nor a way of pursuing a hidden political agenda. Rather, this aspect of Rushar Onkati's life may be placed under the sign of convivium, simply the gathering of work colleagues, teaching assistants, family, and friends around the dining table. As her daughter remarked, and I quote, non ha separato le cose, end of quote, she didn't separate things. In keeping with both cultural custom and personal history, the social expectation of playing hostess was an integral and productive part of Rishar Onkati's life. At the same time, this readiness to mix categories such as personal life, work relationships, teaching relationships, and so forth, can also be read as an unwillingness, inability even, to separate them. The notion of convivium is a first step in understanding Rishar Onkati's life and work. Hi, my name is Olga Tulumi and I'm reading an excerpt from If on a Winter's Night Azari by Sarover Zaidi and Samprati Pani. Are we to accept the barricades, the busloads of gun-totting police and the use of excessive force as the new ordinary? Does the folding in of the protest into the ordinary through repeated marches, banners, and sit-ins make the protest lose its impact as the analysts claim? Perhaps the protests have run their course in providing material for television debates, academic papers, artist projects, and hate speeches. Has difference finally set itself in a quiet repetition has the apparatus of the state figured out how to enumerate these differences? Are we fighting for elections for schools and not for the rights of the protesting students? Is protest the only apparatus left that can occupy the street, create the street, and hold together democracy? Do we exist because we're alive or because we hold a piece of paper or a flag in our hands? Is repeating the chant of freedom our beauty? 
our bravery for our naivete. My name is Noura Akkawi. I'm reading an excerpt from On Diffraction's Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration by Anurada Ir Siddiqui and Rachel Lee, where the authors introduce this wonderful and much needed collection of essays. It starts with a quote from Diffracting Diffraction, Cutting Together Apart by Karen Barad. Diffractions are untimely. Time is out of joint. It is diffracted, broken apart in different directions, non-contemporaneous with itself. Each moment is an infinite multiplicity. These diffractions, or more precisely, these narratives of a moment of diffraction, churn and return, revisiting time and time frames. They loosen sediment and surface fresh entanglements, opening the past to arrays of new presents and futures. Situated but unfixed, the movement inherent to their making and remaking as they expand and contract interweaves chronologies and shapes dynamic grounds for fluid interpretation. The interactivity of connected timeframes across territories through which architectures are negotiated is itself migrant. My name is Maria Novas, and I'm reading an excerpt from Verden, Borders and Bodies, American Crossings by Lori Brown. Heather Itty's historical analysis describes how changes in economic systems disproportionately affect women. Globalization produces, according to Heather Itty, the feminization of poverty. Although women are integrated into this economy, specifically given the search in manufacturing jobs that the North American free trade agreement produce, the current phase of globalization has resulted in the massive numbers of Central Americans and Mexicans fleeing their homelands in pursuit of employment and safety. Thousands hope to forge different futures, crossing into the US and overflowing the capacities of shelters and border processing stations. Religious, nonprofit, and private organizations, like the Verdian centers I have described here, have responded to fill the immense holes left by retreating government policies. The creative flexibility and adaptability of those providing care demonstrate how buildings can be reimagined to perform in many unintended ways and uses. I'm the art history. My name is Rachel Lee, and I am reading from On Collaborations, Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration. Migration uncycles and recycles. It implies the spatial reconstruction of lives and domesticities at different locations across borders and within unfamiliar cultural contexts. Migration exposes vulnerabilities and uncertainties. It lays bare power imbalances and social and spatial injustices. Examining architecture through the lens of migration clarifies the relations and interdependencies undergirding spatial production built form, use, and understandings of the constructed environment. This method illuminates the diffracting trajectories of people and things in migration, revealing histories that may otherwise have remained inscrutable and illuminating the diversity of agencies, processes, and practices that do not fit obediently into received categories of thought. Thinking with migration, unravels neatly packaged narratives of individually authored buildings, exposing more complex arcs of vibrant co-production. Perhaps most trenchantly, migration as a concept draws a bold circle around masculinist forms and practices of history writing that do not depend upon love and camaraderie for their sheer existence. So I'll give Rachel the last word there. Um, and uh, just want to thank these readers and also the authors of this wonderful collection. 
Um, Rachel and I would really like to acknowledge their fine work and great patience as this project came together. So tonight, we attempted to gather authors of some of the long format scholarly articles. In addition to those I'm honored to share the stage with, allow me to acknowledge Juan Du, who hosted an in-person launch of this collection in November at the University of Toronto, and is the author of The Nail House of the Sent Down Girl, Exile and Migration in China's Modern City, as well as Lori A. Brown, who was unable to join us this evening and is the author of Birthing Borders and Bodies, American Crossings. So tonight we will hear from S. E. Eisterer, um, author of two of the articles, Dear Comrade or Exile in a Communist World, Resistance, Feminism, and Urbanism in Margrethe Schutte-Lihotsky's <coughs> Work in China, 1934-1956, and Spatial Practices of Dissidence, Identity, Fragmentary Archives, and the Austrian Resistance in Exile, 1938 to 1945. She will be followed by Armagan Zie, the author of On Contradictions, The Architecture of Women's Resistance and Emancipation in Early 20th Century Iran. Then Eunice Seng, the author of Working Women and Architectural Work, Hong Kong, 1945 to 1985. And finally, Ross Exo Adams, the author of Enclosed Bodies, Locating Serdaz Urbanization Within Federici's History of Capitalism. Ross will join us on Zoom. Uh, followed, uh, following that, we'll have responses first from Professor Atia Korakiola, then the GSAP X Plus students, and then Bryony Roberts, who will moderate the Q&A to follow. So if I may, I would like to invite SE to the podium. Thank you, Anu. Thank you so much, Anu, for um, the invitation to present here tonight. And I'm just going to present a very short reflection on my second essay that Anu just mentioned um, for the collection on collaboration. Maybe we can go to the next slide. On the issue of um, on collaboration, I wanted to acknowledge the help of many, many people who were involved in shaping this essay. Um, and because we're at Columbia, I particularly want to thank Elliot Stuyvesant, who worked tirelessly to make um, this collection possible in the context of aggregate. Um, and I also want to note that, and Meredith knows this very well, um, it was very important for me that this essay be fragmentary that two narratives can run in parallel to one another. And Elliot um, worked to kind of make that fragmentary nature of the essay possible. So, a guest house, an apartment, a safe house, an editorial office, a cultural institute, a farm, a cover, a font, a translation, a letter exchange, an encrypted message, or a single word. Resistance in exile against the Nazi regime was formulated in ordinary spaces. It materialized in mundane rooms, buildings, and landscapes, in private domestic settings, and semi-public places. These spaces were clandestine, and often they were temporary. And they constituted the backdrop against which artifacts of dissidence, textual and visual, were created. In my essay for Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration, um, with the title Special Practices of Dissidence, I sought to illuminate sites of dissidence in emigration, exile, and internment in four twinned fragments and in two main storylines. These narratives constitute histories of both suffering and defiance, or what historian Ernst Löwy understood as the twinned character of exile. In this brief reflection, it's important for me to point out two main things. First, how my essay took up the important interventions posited by the collection editors, and second, the arguments I sought to make within that context. In their earliest versions of the call, Rachel Lee and Anurada Aya Siddiqui made two critical arguments in framing the collection um, from a feminist perspective. That is, 
how to write both from a place of situatedness and a view from the body following Donna Haraway while taking in consideration the fundamental instability of historiographies, biographies, histories and objects, as well as archives that are being made in conditions of exile, migra migration, and in the case I'm telling, internment. I took up these questions by writing a comparative history, if one will, of two groups of people who conducted resistance work against the Nazi regime between 1938 and 1945. Um, and one, one of these histories moves from Turkey to Austria, and the other history um, moves from Paris to New York. Histories of resistance have often been structured around nation states um, or political groups that organized said dissident activity. One of the histories in my essay follows this trajectory in part and is based on the labors of working class women. But the other narrative, and this is critical, undoes these structures and follows what literary scholars such as Dörte Bischoff, Esther Kilchmann, and Christoph Gabriel have articulated as a main characteristic of artistic production in conditions of exile, that is, quote, to formulate a claim to cultural belonging beyond claims to state power and territorial demarcation. And this is a notion of culture resistance as it was first articulated in Jewish studies. In fact, scholars in Jewish studies, English, German, and literature have long argued that the production of text in exile has rendered exilic conditions legible, and for me, architecture too mediated these conditions. In the essay, one of the major questions is why architectural history has so long confirmed narratives of oppression, especially if we think of the volumes of books on Nazi architecture, rather than working actively against them. By this, I mean to ask, what would it mean to trace histories, biographies, and spatial and artistic production from the perspective of the victims? One of the objects that is important here is a piece of weave works produced in internment. You see the, it here. These slippers were created through the embodied and clandestine labor of working class women who saved pieces of threads um, from rag rocks in their garments. Um, and these remnants, uh, they kind of ex used as they were condemned to undertake um, forced labor in Gestapo prisons in Vienna. When these objects have been discussed at all, and they have not been discussed very often um, because they allied both art histories and resistance studies conventional systems of classification. Scholars have held on to the political ca sorry, categorizations of their makers, that is working class solidarities of women in the framework of the Communist Party. But as I try to show, these objects were also imprints of spatial histories that defy these categories um, as each thread um, passed through many hands was made to pass through wall and especially as gifts of solidarity uh, were transported in great, great danger. But in conclusion, I also want to say, and this is essential, what these objects are not. Evoking Bischof, it is noteworthy that their symbolism and the idea of the potential of one day walking into a future that might again be possible is tied to a notion of nationhood that the Communist Party underscored and where there was a belief in this possible return to everyday life. So formulating a claim to cultural beyond, belonging beyond claims to state power and territorial demarcation by contrast, as Bischoff would have it, is um, what I tried to foreground in the second essay. Here I ask, what would it mean if architectural, consider, architectural history considered the spatial and visual production of refugee organizations, such as Jewish journalists, authors, and poets working together in the offices of Nouvelle d'Autriche in Paris, and we see here a cover. Forced to flee Vienna, editors of the journal which existed for little more than a year from 1938 to 1939, thought to provide life, cultural, and especially legal advice through events, a permanent office, and eventually the journal. Graphic work 
as well as the texts drew on multiple modes of knowing and speaking using dialects and puns geared towards people with a shared experience of displacement and persecution. These constructions of identity move beyond binary notion of citizenships and against polit the politics of persecution, which especially for Austrians of Jewish descent meant being able to affirm a right to country as well as to reject it and beyond that to articulate multiple modes of belonging. And I think I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, thanks for this um, um, event, organizing it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and sharing a space with you all, especially right now, which is the celebration of Nowruz or the Iranian New Year. Um, and I hope this new year brings um, joy, health, and prosperity to everyone, especially women um, in Iran. Um, so the article that I wrote on, on contradictions, um, it was uh, very dear to me because of multiple reasons. Uh, for sure, one reason uh, was that this was the history of uh, women's rights um, uh, in Iran, which I was also part of this history. I lived um, uh, and grew up in Iran. Um, and it was also um, important for me to share it through a feminist and also architecture lens somehow bringing that interdisciplinary and intersectional notion uh, to the conversation. Uh, and of course, it was also important for me because the history of women's rights and their freedom in Iran, as we all see, uh, intersects with modernization of public and private spaces, nationalism and fundamentalism. Um, and um, it's uh, still going on and it's uh, among one of the complex and contradictory histories as um, you all see right now um, and the news from Iran. Um, as you all might know, uh, despite uh, enormous contradictions um, and the challenges, whether it's uh, inside challenges or outside challenges, um, Iranian women uh, always um, showed their activism and resistance uh, when it comes to you know, um, different topics, including um, nationalism and modernization um, in early 20th century Iran, um, and um, you know, um, um, showed their um, activism from the most marginalized spaces that were given to them. And we should not forget the geopolitical location of Iran as an you know, outside maybe factor that affects uh, all their activism and you know, existence in public and private spaces. Um, and I also wanted to highlight that another important point uh, in the article that I wanted to highlight was um, uh, how modern architecture um, and modernization of public and private spaces, and of course, uh, urban modern practices in Iran uh, created this element of um, you know, um, biopolitics and uh, macropolitics um, for uh, women in Iran, in which their bodies have been uh, subjugated, uh, disciplined, and controlled uh, by the state uh, and through state surveillance. So whether it was modernization or nationalism, or uh, right now, we see how they're bodies being centered uh, to be um, surveilled by the state. Um, and uh, their bodies became this liminal space of you know, acceptance and resistance. Um, and um, it was very important then to highlight this history of their presence um, and how uh, by their presence in public and private uh, state, uh, spaces, they uh, challenged you know, the hegemonic views on uh, gender, ethnicity, class, um, um, and um, you know, uh, religion in Iran. Um, and uh, I see writing um, histories um, through a feminist lens. Um, and um, one goal of me by writing this history was um, uh, showing how we can put activism into practice of writing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, my goal was not only to um, publish um, a piece as an intellectual piece, but bringing that active activism notion, um, uh, showing that as feminist architecture historians, one of our goal needs to be how we historicize uh, and shed lights uh, um, on important histories. Um, and uh, also, I think it's important important for us to realize our standpoint um, and how we need to center the knowledge that needs to be centered in our architecture discipline. So methodology, uh, methodologically speaking, um, seeing like oral history as a valid methodology um, can serve as a, a kind of like contribution um, in this piece as well. 
Uh, also, um, uh, how, um, you know, when we talk about um, uh, consumption of spaces or occupation of spaces, how we imagine social justice, uh, I think that was one of the uh, points that I wanted to highlight uh, in the article, um, and how, again, it's our responsibility to, um, you know, share the histories of those, particularly women and minorities, who shape the discipline outside the boundaries of discipline, uh, just by, by producing the space and reproducing the uh, space that were uh, given to them. Um, and uh, I want to end um, and highlight this important point um, of the work that Anu and Rachel, um, you know, did by um, uh, bringing all these voices together. Because I think one, um, whether we call ourselves, um, you know, our, um, an ally, an advocate, or, you know, in solidarity with women's rights or feminism or a minority's right, is showing how we put it into practice. And I think this collaboration by itself shows how we can uh, be an ally and advocate and care about everyone. When I say everyone, I mean everyone uh, in this <coughs> world. And uh, I would greatly appreciate Anu and Rachel for doing that because they really, uh, at least for me, being in diaspora, they really helped me to be the voice of, um, or echo the voice of uh, women in Iran by writing this history and bring their, um, um, you know, uh, existence uh, into uh, publication. Um, and I would say that the production of this uh, piece is not only the physical, again, production of knowledge, and it goes beyond that. It's about care, it's about ethics, and it's also about the emotional labor that I know, uh, Rachel and all uh, authors and editors put into this work. So we need, we cannot measure that. What we need to think about that and how that means or what that means to us in terms of uh, feminist uh, collaboration or feminist architectural histories of collaboration. So I'm going to end here. Thank you. Uh, good evening. So about two months ago, I received an email from um, a woman by the name of Maureen Fan. And uh, the email was simple. It says, I believe you want to talk to my mother. <laughs> so obviously, I wrote her and said, who is your mother? And she said, my mother is Doreen Fan. So who is Doreen Fan? I've been searching for Doreen for five years, since 2018. So um, and did not manage to. So if uh, you had actually read my footnotes, I had made a disclaimer that um, I did not find her um, in my uh, paper that's titled Working Women and Architectural Work, Hong Kong, 1945 and 1985. So let me go backwards about why Doreen is really important uh, in uh, the project that I'm working on. Doreen is one of four women that uh, was the first batch of graduates from the University of Hong Kong in 1955. The architecture school was founded in 1950, so um, I, I had um, encountered Doreen's name in um, another project, a book manuscript that I'm working on, on precarious buildings in Hong Kong looking at uh, mid-century buildings that were built by very renowned architects that have since fallen into um, somewhat kind of mismanagement. And uh, I'm in the process of writing that manuscript. And in so doing, discovered that one of the largest projects which housed 10,000 inhabitants in one single housing estate had someone by the name of uh, Doreen Fun in it. And the reason why this stood out is because of the entire team that um, was listed. Doreen was the only one that had her credentials, uh, which says Doreen Fun, Harvard GSD. So um, for, to cut the story short, I started an investigation uh, that led to my paper uh, with the question, where are the women architects in Hong Kong? And, um, and where are women in Hong Kong's architectural history? Asking this question reveals two issues. First, in the early 20th century, women rarely stepped out of familiar and Chinese state patriarchies and hierarchies to enter the workforce, let alone practice architecture. Second, 
Those who did not have been hidden in the records behind collaborations in a system that privileges monographic authorship of buildings. This is, of course, not unique to Hong Kong. So when I was invited to, to participate in this colla uh, collaborative, I was elated because uh, for, for the first time, I started to understand there's such a thing called the feminist analytic. And I was being very opportunistic um, on jumping onto that so-called bandwagon. So the question then is, where do I find the women and how do we even begin? Um, so I started with two um, periods. One is to look into the archives of the university to identify and to locate where are the women. This sounds easy, but it was a very arduous task because there's a serious privacy involved in the releasing of even the names, let alone um, contact. And the second is within um, the context of colonial Hong Kong, women, as soon as they are married, will uh, be initialized as well as they will take on their husband's name. So there was no way I could I'd, um, locate them at, when they were students versus uh, when they are practicing architects. So this is among some of the challenges that face in the construction of uh, this archive. However, I do want to um, share the last few years of building up this archive and what it means uh, by way of just concluding my very quick statement, which is to say that um, in order to situate women architects within the history of uh, um, women who work, I um, looked at four um, perspectives. One is from the geopolitical situation that saw the labor emancipation of women en masse in mid 20th century Hong Kong. The other is to look through the lens of the education and professional, uh, professionalization of the architect. Thirdly, um, is to examine from the perspective of the colonial and Chinese shaping of gender roles and the, and the family and how it evolved in the last half century. And finally, in the representation of women in the public sphere. So this is a, an archive in construction which uh, involves many people whom uh, I have named uh, in the article. And it's an ongoing project to and the project has spun off also into requests from other places in Asia, specifically at the moment Singapore, to conduct a similar project. So something I'm going to start on soon. And I'm going to leave you with my archive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um. I just wanted to pick up on something that Armagan mentioned, uh, which is how to put into practice feminist histories of architecture um, and, and expressing a sense of gratitude and uh, joy in, in, in working with Rachel and Anu um, and you know, the amount of emotional labor and care and really generosity in uh, bringing what I feel like is in my work, I, I sort of see this somehow strangely um, I don't know, fitting into various forms of history uh, in, in sort of weird ways. So just to, to really express that gratitude and, and patience uh, that was, was given to me. Um, so um, in my piece, uh, as opposed to thinking about migration as a condition of and or for research, um, mine approaches it through the conditions of its possibility, through the ways in which mobility and immobility have imprinted themselves onto the spaces and ways of inhabiting the modern world. Um, and this is something that's been central to my work, the idea of circulation. So when I first read um, Federici's Caliban and the Witch uh, years ago, um, I'm assuming it's a familiar text with most people, um, uh, it occurred to me that there's really a history of architecture to be written that can complement her history of the body, a history that covers roughly the same period and takes a similar kind of political and epistemological view to the construction of gender uh, that my own work has done with the emergence of the urban. So this essay is in part a kind of prelude to such a history, 
Um, it's kind of an attempt to kind of correlate the enclosure of women's bodies and gendered social relations of capital that Caliban traces uh, with the rise of a new understanding of uh, space that's increasingly defined by mobility and immobility across this kind of division. So the piece does this in two kind of moves, if you will. Uh, the first is a kind of provocation to read Caliban and the witch architecturally. Um, because Federici's claim is an epistemological one, it seems to me that we should be able to read a sort of dialectical imprint of the new, this new human body uh, that she describes uh, across archives of architecture, of spatial planning, of infrastructure, and beyond. Uh, and indeed, Federici suggests as much with the enclosure of lands as colonial acquisitions or under the new regime of private property, the body, she argues, is simultaneously enclosed in new social relations. Further, in the discourses and experiences of 16th and 17th century European colonialism, of empirical scientific method, of new understandings of nature, of material wars and conquests, and so on, this new human is one which appears to be eminently divisible along anatomical lines uh, that sort of naturally or so-called naturally offer itself to emergent social orders, hierarchies, and labor regimes of a nascent capitalism. So reading Caliban and the Witch architecturally, I believe, allows us to understand the role uh, that architecture and space have played as social technologies, as I like to think of them, that sort of somehow undergird the gendering of the body. If the human of an emergent capitalism is seen to be made divisible according to anatomical markers like race and gender, then we can start to see how certain corresponding divisions appear as functional partitions in domestic architecture of the same period, separating productive and reproductive labor, forms of labor. So the second move that I tried to make in the piece then is to follow these socio-spatial divisions uh, outside of and beyond the house. Um, while the violent processes of disciplining gender onto women's bodies across 16th century Europe is evident in the period's architectural history, it, I argue that it's not really until the middle of the 19th century that both this conception of the body and a politics attuned to managing it found their correlates in a kind of certain spatial imaginary, uh, a theoretical model uh, in which space and governance could be co-organized to maintain and reproduce this divided uh, body and divided in laboring body. This model for me is Ildefonso Serda's concept of urbanization. urbanization. It's a term he actually coined. Um, Serda's prolific writings reveal a, a spatial imaginary built, however inadvertently, um, on the governing of gender through immobility and mobility across this divide. Keeping with Federici's uh, Caliban and the Witch, it's hard to read Serda's Urbe as anything but a multi-scalar set of gendered technologies of enclosure that reduces space to a binary of two elements, infrastructures of total, literally total mobility, uh, built for the mobile settling man, and domestic spaces of total immobility designed for the settled and nearly invisible woman. The lens of immobility and mobility cuts not only down, uh, cuts not only the Urbe down the middle, but it also produces a human split in two. So reading Serda's theory of urbanization from the imagined bodies for which he theorized it reveals the contours of a subtle network of gendered spaces and technologies that govern them. In a sense, the second move then mirrors the first. To read Serda corporeally, according to Federici's history of the body, is to begin to understand how gender, capitalism, and space continue to be articulated across the planetary urbe that we dwell in today. Good evening, thank you, Anu and Rachel, for putting together this fascinating collection. Um, I thought one way to respond to this intellectual call to think and write feminist architectural histories of migration was to consider the purpose of a call for papers and the work of bringing into being, juxtaposing, organizing, and arranging a collection of research. So a key aspect of an edited collection is that it helps shape a field in the sense that authors respond to a call and shape their work towards that call. And it is clear that your call has provoked new research that wouldn't have found a way into the world um, without your provocation to both produce it and your labor to house it. 
uh, reading the essays, I was thinking about the work of the psychoanalytical theorist, uh, Jacqueline Rose, who writes in her book, Mothers, an essay on love and cruelty, that the anger and hatred unleashed on migrant mothers entering the United Kingdom settles not just on women, but specifically on migrant mothers. Migrant mothers, she says, says Rose, are being asked to carry and be accountable for the failures and injustices of the modern world. She underscores the double bind that migrant mothers face, that by fleeing war zones and violence, they are vilified for both hoping for better lives for their children and also for exposing their children to the perils of migration. They will always be bad mothers, no matter what they do. What Rose argues is that in the act of migration, mothers are asked to do two things. Shield their children from the violence of history, uh, uh, the wars that they are fleeing, and in the United Kingdom, maintain the fiction of a just world, a world without violence. Mm -hmm. And this double bind seems to be at the heart of this collaborative project, uh, where migration creates a set of contradictions that can sometimes be possibility and at other times be binds. But the key here is that this double bind settles itself on the bodies of women. It needs feminist interrogation. Anu and Rachel ask the authors to think migration in all the multitudinal ways that bodies and women's bodies move through space and move across peripheries, borders, fringes, exteriors, interiors, buffers, surpluses, edges, and more. In this way, marginality itself creates a migratory condition. Another way to put this is that migration itself involves an amount and is an account of violence. If migration as method allows us to interrogate the violent histories of architecture and space making, then collaboration, the editors offer, is a structural antidote uh, to the violence enacted by migration in the modern world. This collaboration brings together multiple different forms of this condition of mobility, and it focuses on the different ways in which women carve out pathways to move through the world. Collaborations um, are central, of course, to this body of work, theoretically and logistically. And I was struck by Eunice's essay, with, uh, where the form of collaboration also hid the labor of women when it functioned within the bounds of the myth of individual authorship. As a result, to make an archive of women in architecture, Eunice argues that first you need to do the intellectual labor of understanding what constitutes labor and what are the structural constraints on participatory collaboration. What structural shifts make collaborative labor into valued work? Armagan's paper, which shows how the modernization and masculinization of space went hand in hand, argues that this gendering of women and space was enacted through laws mandating uh, unveiling. This gendering occurred in relation to the emergence of a seemingly egalitarian public sphere. So Armagan's essay captures that fraught double bind that women are caught in when they become symbolic subjects of modernization and national, uh, nation state making. In forcing and unveiling, women were denied a normative right to public space and in turn produced counter spaces of habitation and access. Ross's essay also tackles the violence structurally embedded in migration, where economic forces render one set of bodies mobile and another immobile, creating the conditions of unfettered access to laboring bodies. If mobility is one form of migratory violence, then another explicit form of it is exile. Essie's body of work around the life and work of Margaret Schutter Lihotsky centers the question of how to be in exile. All forms of migration involve a component of exile, a forced separation from a condition of belonging. And indeed, Essie speaks to this isolation 
that Schutte Lehotzky experienced even inside Austria. Schutte Lehotzky, Elizabeth Freundlich, and, their collabor and with other collaborators, argues Essi, used this condition of exile to interrogate political and intellectual forms of uh, Nazism and fascism. And from Essi's article, the aggregate essay, uh, the aggregate essay, not the other one, we know that not only is migration a method, but so too is exile a kind of subjectivity that needs, one that needs ordinary spaces in which the exiled perform the subjectivity of their exiled bodies. So final words, congratulations on this wonderful volume, uh, on this wonderful body of work. Congratulations on this generous act of collaboration. Um, I have very much enjoyed dipping into it and immersing myself in this collection of stories and the force of their intellectual framework. Uh, and with that, I will turn the mic over to the GSAP X students. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for the great presentations. Um, it is very powerful to hear and see the breadth of feminist strategies of countering power through the undertaking of history writing, especially through the lens of constructed environments. We would also like to thank Anais, who cannot be here today, but who did work in conjunction with us to formulate this response. Through the discussion on histories of migration and feminist practice, it is evident and imperative that the future of architecture should lie within the power of collaboration, building on the foundation of a pedagogy of the, of the oppressed via architecture and the unwritten forms of power in the built environment. These unwritten forms of power lend themselves to what architects should be thinking of, the dimensions of people, culture, and the importance of not generalizing individuals. Through this lens, we see that the intention of architecture is not its totality. Architects then cannot claim to control what happens in the space or even the individuals who will use the space, but rather work towards unveiling an alternate urban plan or a counter hegemonic plan created by the people and subverting spatial codes. As architectural students, it's imperative not just to look at the future, but also to look at the past and the ways in which people react and create their own resistance to architecture and the built environment which surrounds them. Migration unravels narratives of individuals and buildings, yet it was discussed that migration as a concept draws a bold circle around masculinist forms and practices of history writing that do not depend upon love and camaraderie for their sheer existence. This begs the question, why must love and camaraderie be strictly feminist? By placing these terms in the sphere of feminist practices, we must be critical in framing them so they're not just seen as just feminist approaches, but rather introduce them as a new architectural ethos in which all can contribute. The ideals of collaboration and migration should not be thought of as simply as feminist practice. In doing so, this narrows the potential of these topics that can be seen in a strictly feminist light. We ask ourselves as future architects, what kind of work can we do to incorporate the approaches and critical understandings discussed to get today? What is a practice of radical reimagination of both our buildings and the roles we ascribe to it? Hello again. Um, I'm going to keep this brief since as moderator, I'm also in charge of keeping time. So um, I just want to celebrate this wonderful format that you've created, much like the sort of polyphonic narrative that you described um, in the video project and the anthology. Um, I think it's wonderful. Um, and so I'm going to pose a, a response that's also a question so we can kind of transition into the Q&A phase of the event. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the attention to embodiment in all of your essays um, and how that's prompted different method methodologies in writing history for all of you. Um, and speaking here as a sort of bridge to architectural practice, I'm also wondering what the implications of that attention might be for material design practices. Um, so Anuradha, in the introductory essay to the collections, um, you point to different lineages of feminist epistemologies that have called for greater attention to embodied experience. And there have been many different perspectives on this over time. Um, calls to embodiment have been ways of foregrounding the experiences of marginalized people 
and also challenges to the conceptual binaries of mind and body and productive and reproductive labor. And you write, the feminist architectural histories of migration demand sensibility as much as theory. These essays may be understood as much through affect and emotions as through formal concepts or ideologies. And it's a theme that reappears in many of the essays. So Ross writes, writes about this as well, talking about shifting the historical analysis to the body and unsettling the presiding scholarly logic of architectural history that starts with buildings. And I think it's amazing how all of you are turning to sort of source material that can speak directly to embodied experience. So Armagon, Eunice, and SE, you're drawing from sources that might be outside of um, a typical sort of architectural archive, looking at diaries, memoirs, letters, personal photographs, um, and SE even kind of deconstructing the format of the essay itself um, through these fragments, which I think really evoke in their structure a sense of loss, disjunction, and trauma. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you all um, about this sort of feminist methodology of writing history that you're exploring, um, how, it, how it's connected to feminist epistemologies about embodied knowledge, and specifically why embodiment might be particularly important to pay attention to in the context of migration. And I have you know, some speculations about is it perhaps that in migration the body is the, is the sort of moving subject where the geography is located now since there's a disconnection between the body and um, you know, kind of situated context that's stable. Um, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. And then um, as we maybe transition to questions from the audience, thinking about that transition also to um, design practice, um, how do you see that intention to embodiment play out in the practices that you looked at? Was there a greater awareness of embodied experience through the programs that people were working on, through their work with materials? Um, are there sort of lessons there as well that we can draw from in thinking about contemporary practice? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should jump in. Thank you so much, uh, both Atia and Bryony and Sophia and Rebecca. You've all been so generous. We really appreciate it. Um, does someone want to take up Bryony's questions? Even the disembodied Ross? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm, I'm just going to say something quickly. Um, I like the provocation by Sophia and Rebecca. Um, why, you know, why must these histories of care and camaraderie, why must they be feminist? Um, and maybe I, I just want to make like two very quick remarks. So I, I think one of the issues, of course, that hovers over our conversation is the question of, of gender, obviously, and gender per performativity, that everybody you know, has a gender, that it's socially constructed. And so I think like, you, know, you bringing us back to this question, I guess like what you're asking, or I'm not sure if I heard that right, is you know, why are women at the, a center, at the center of this? And I honestly believe they don't have to be. You know? I mean, love and care and camaraderie exists between all kinds of agents we, we research. But I do think that like a, a close attention to gender and how it is constructed is really important and kind of what modes of operating de derive from that. Um, in addition to that, I maybe also wanted to say that intersectionality for me, of course, was important for um, both essays as a concept, but also that um, those constructions in specific conditions that certain categories can be more important. So in the end of Kimberly Crenshaw's famous essay, I think there's kind of an opening that nobody really ever discusses where one category in intersectionality can actually be more important than other categories and that needs to kind of be the center of forming certain types of alliances. And so maybe this is kind of a mo a too porous of an answer, but I do think that our histories 
need to be written in a type of awareness of, of, of historiography and like what kind of categories at the intersection of gender, race, age, you know, um, shape those those histories. And I think we need to attend to those. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, maybe mm. I pick from where you um, um, actually ended by saying that First of all, um, I personally believe why not all of us should be feminists, right? So when we think about social justice um, and the ways in which, um, uh, as you mentioned, we need to have an intersectional lens, thinking about gender, class, uh, race, uh, ethnicity, religion, and the list can goes on and on, we really all need to think about how um, the life um, is different for each one of us because of, uh, you know, um, our position uh, within this world, whether it's about, um, you know, um, about any of uh, these uh, categories of identity, uh, but also be mindful of um, Kimberly Crenshaw's theory in which she doesn't mention the Olympics of oppression. We're not talking about who the most oppressed person in the room is so that we go um, and say, okay, then let's talk about them, but about how these identities intersect. And th that intersection, I think, is uh, very important for any kind of social justice practices, architecture should be um, the main one, maybe, uh, when we think about how uh, we all occupy a space, right, and how a space can be inclusive and exclusive to different bodies only because of their identities. So even if we think about uh, migration and travel ban and, you know, um, anything that relates to a physical and abstract borders, um, I also wanted to think about how, you know, this piece serves as um, all of these, you know, writings in relation to your question, um, you know, serves as a way for us to reimagine what we are doing in the practice of architecture and the future of the practice of architecture in terms of how we can bring new methodologies and new histories into place so we know what we are, we are really doing um, um, in our uh, practice of architecture. So uh, whether it's about teaching or practice or you know new methodologies, it's about people. So centering people, their stories and their, intersection, their uh, intersectional background, I think is very important for any kind of like um, social justice topic, which uh, I think is very important for the histories of um, um, you know um, the world and also migration. So um, yeah, just just adding a little bit to what Esli mentioned. Maybe um, I'll pick up on the point of methodology. Um, in the context of um, uh, my research project, I discover really it started very simply as um, trying to figure out other ways to rethink the monographic method as a way to evaluate uh, the profession. Uh, or the professional history. And so that's how I, um, I would be quite honest to confess I stumbled onto this project in the process of um, trying to figure out what are the various other ways can, uh, in which we can um, write about the, you know, the, the, the disciplinary history. And uh, so on that note, it opened up other questions that um, I didn't learn before as an architecture student, like how do you deal with when uh, with um, gender plus class issue or gender plus race uh, or uh, with age, and these are what I discovered in the last few years of trying to build up an archive, and it has led to um, uh, essentially a reflection of um, what I'm doing as a method. Uh, into a question that is bigger than gender already. So, and also in the context of Asia, which is where I'm building up this archive, a feminist lens is a, it's a very different conversation as it is in here. So I'll need to situate that as well, because uh, um, if there's such a thing as feminism, it's discussed very differently um, as it is here, just as race uh, discussions is very different also. Um, so it's not very binary, these questions. Um, for example, racial discussion is not binary. So, um, so actually I'm answering two questions. Um, with, with regard to embodiment, every uh, woman architect in Hong Kong is a migrant. Uh, at least all the ones I've interviewed. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's impossible uh, in the first few um, generations 
to be able to afford architectural school mm -hmm. if you're not coming from um, a place of relative wealth. And they tend to be not, uh, if you, just a quick history of Hong Kong. The majority uh, are really working class uh, migrants. So the only way you can enter architecture school is if you're coming from uh, a very different kind of status from South China and so on. So inherently, uh, it is uh, bigger than a feminist project already. It's trying to understand the, the evolving uh, geopolitical situation. So, and that really helps, uh, well, at least it helps me a lot in trying to understand how the shaping of a practice Ross, do you have any thoughts you want to share? I, I do. Thank you. Um, maybe just coming back to the question about, um, you know, uh, an awareness of historiography uh, that Armadan brought up, um, and how this somehow how how, it's, how it brings into question uh, something that, of course, is central to a lot of this all, all of this work, which is identity, and um, it, it's sort of. I'm reminded that identity is never a kind of standalone category um, and that it needs uh, institutions and networks of power to constantly reproduce itself. Um, and this sort of rings up Otami Taiwo's uh, uh, work on identity politics and uh, his shifting of, from, from kind of identity to the sort of room as he talks about in the, in the spaces in which um, uh, identity is again reproduced and, uh, or, or uh, attenuated or whatever. Um, and I, I think all of this uh, comes back to, for me at least, to thinking about how various methods uh, that we, I think, are all trying to embrace uh, run up against, or perhaps within, uh, in some cases, institutional structures. You know, we're, we're all academics. Um, we all, you know, have to receive some kind of validation from an institution. Uh, and in a way, uh, I think that puts the added pressure, uh, in a good sense, on uh, notions of collaboration, um, embodying uh, practices of love and, and, and uh, camaraderie and comradeship and so on, um, that puts, uh, in a way that, that puts us in the position to maybe claim uh, uh, ourselves as activists in a sense, or, or as people who are actively working uh, to push against certain institutional norms, uh, certain he hegemonic structures, uh, that goes everywhere from like tenure to the ways in which history is written, the sort of norms that we assume as history writers, um, and, and that we start to really unsettle these kinds of things and push back against um, uh, these structures. So I guess just, you know, an, an attention to the institutional forms in which, uh, you know, our, all of our work, I think, is, is uh, playing out is important to keep in mind. Thank you. So we have some time for questions from the audience. I think we have a couple of microphones going around. So if anyone has questions, can you raise your hand? Let a microphone come to you. Well, thank you, firstly, for these presentations. This is a question about what it means to do feminist history more broadly, and maybe particularly feminist architectural history. Several, um, maybe most of your accounts, it seemed um, in locating disappeared histories, forgotten accounts, attempted to sublimate the work of women in particular in these particular situations to forms of resistance or community that um, represents a sort of possibility of an otherwise of moving beyond the conditions to which they're subject. I'm thinking of um, affiliations with other modes of historiography like for instance, Sedgwick's notion of reparative reading, right, which attempts to resuscitate from what are typically narratives of oppression, modes of eking out resistance and community and solidarity and joy. I'm also thinking of Robin and Gigi Kelly's notion of freedom dreaming, right, the way that uh, notions of liberation can, first, can be conjured amidst desperation. So the question is whether something like a reparative mode, something of trying to read into these histories, um, vitality, resistance, uh, the possibility of doing something else is nece necessary to feminist history uh, or feminist architectural history, or if this is the mode of femi feminist architectural history that you are practicing. 
I can reclare. I can kind of clarify that if it's mm -hmm. not so. I can. Yet. I can take this question, even unclarified. <laughs> um, I think that um, one of the reasons that we even structured this event this evening in the way that we did was that um, for us, the you know the answer is yes. There can be that mode of resistance, or as we've thought of it, a provincialization of normative histories, but. We also feel like there can be many answers to that question, and it was very important to make a platform where there could be many different dissenting arguments around that very question, or even around this very question of what does, what, what does feminism have to be, or does something have to be feminist to be X, Y, Z? We ourselves had many different answers over the course of these many years. And, you know, the first publication was in 2020, but we had been working on the collection for some years before that. And I think that um, part of why we thought it would be helpful to show, to even just hear from the, the four authors that we brought together today and also these wonderful respondents is by way of saying there are many ways that this can shape. Um, however, there is something to be said for gathering forces around something rather than knowing that you're in it, having a lens onto something rather than assuming that what you are doing is normative. I mean, I think that one can look at this collection and also see it as quite normative in certain ways. And um, there will be others. I mean, I think this is a maybe a, a kind of rolling critical process. But that's what I take from your question, actually, is, the, is a, a call to a kind of pluralism. So uh, thank you. So uh, I would also add um, to what Anu mentioned uh, in regards to your question that, you know, by nature, this collaboration and uh, different pieces in this collaboration, I think, is a form of resistance to the grand narrative that we see and read in architecture histories, right? Um, and um, also, um, with, without even mentioning like the resistance that actually people did in case of my writing, uh, women's resistance in Iran, um, the form, uh, the format that I wrote my article was a form of resistance. That why we talk about. Um, I don't know, X, Y, Z, um, European male architects work in Iran, but we never talked about how women resisted the spaces that they designed for them. Um, and also in, your, um, in regards to your question about feminism and um, freedom dreaming, I think what any form of feminist writing um, does is first it addresses the structural inequalities that we have in societies and communities. And by that, then they propose this imagined future in which all of us are free. Um, so yeah, this is something that um, I, I wanted to add. Mm. I just have two points. Um, one is um, actually this has become a platform to pursue other um, issues of equity, at least for me, um, that is beyond just the, just the feminist project. So for example, I'm actually uh, um, embarking on a project that wouldn't have been possible if I didn't work on this uh, building of the so-called feminist archive. Uh, which is on uh, custodial sh custodian custodial sh custodians uh, of um, architecture. So that's really um, the process. That's what um, it led to. The other one is a more pragmatic point. Uh, I had applied for a grant for the project and uh, was not successful. But as soon as I demonstrate the uh, collaborative that I'm a part of and applied again. Um, I got the grant, and it, uh, the, the comment from it was very, uh, very case in point. It essentially, um, I built, I, um, for lack of a better word, I took advantage of the, collab the, the collaboration in order to justify um, the significance of the work. I'll just say two sentences very quickly to the question. I think for my own work, I 
sit a lot with silences as well. And um, I think the work of Ruha Benjamin for me, for example, call, comes to mind that, um, you know, is often speculative, but actually like build silences and erasure into those speculations. So um, I think like that's maybe like kind of the position where I would come down to. I did want to take up this question of embodiment that Briani asked about um, to maybe, so to say th two things, one about collaboration and one about embodiment. I think for me, historically, it's really important to say that not every collaboration is fruitful and you know built solidarities. In fact, I think one of the things that I really wanted to show in this essay is while working class women's solidarity has been written out of the historiography of architecture and the Holocaust, there are other issues concerning this group where they actually did real violence in kind of the politics of memory. And so I, I think like I wouldn't overemphasize, you know, the, the just the sheer power of positive. Like, I mean, there, there are also a lot of collaborations that become, um, quite violent, I guess. Um, and so on the question of um, embodiment, I did want to kind of maybe clarify one point about the essay that I didn't get to talk about that concerns kind of archives and memorials. So at the, at the end of the essay, there are two kind of figurations that appear. One is, um, Shudlihotsky's inability to actually build memorials in public space. Um, and so she begins to write a book that is this type of like taking stock of her memory. And in the appendix, she has this long list of women that she met who were all resistance fighters. And I've kind of argued that that is a type of politics of memorialization in the book. Um, is t a type of textual memorial that really notes each of these persons and kind of tracks them down. So, uh, but on the other hand, Elisabeth Freundlich, the other person who's at the center of the story, um, she starts to write um, for theater. And there is a person that emerges really prominently in a lot of the plays. And this person has traces of the biographies of multiple people. So if you read her memoir, this is not actually one person. It's a composite of multiple people. And what's important to me to kind of like answer your question about embodiment is that I felt there were two different types of treatment of archives and bodies. One that tries to note bodies, which is a really, really important, that they were there, which is real, a really important political move and decision, especially in lieu of memorials. But the other approach is a composite of a generation of people. Um, and I just, I think it was really important to put these two types of, um, approaches into conversation and also what kind of different politics vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust they um, they mean, I guess. Mm. That's a really great point, yeah. Um, I want to be mindful of time. Should we do one more question? Or? Does Ross have anything to add? Ross, do you have anything to add? No. <laughs> I'm muting. Um, no, I mean, well, I, again, <laughs> Armageddon, I, I keep picking up where you leave, leave off uh, and finding very generative what you're saying, but like, I, I think that in a way, again, thinking through the ways in which histories of architecture are always kind of written within institutional uh, frameworks, uh, you know, our, our, our profession, if you want to call it, it, it has been a very, you know, kind of well, let's say it's a professionalized form of history writing. Um, and I think one of the um, one of the sort of bits of common sense or, or the kind of hegemonic structures that underlines that is um, the way in which the present or conditions of the present are, are somehow 
uh, not meant to intrude into the practice of history writing. And I think that's a, that's a, it's a shame really. Um, so, you know, I think what a lot of us are, are doing is really uh, writing histories that unapologetically uh, not only uh, engage with questions or, or issues of, of the present or structural questions that continue to inform the, the world in the, in the present, but that, that carry a certain um, core or seed, or I don't know what metaphor to use, that, that um, looks towards a different kind of future, looks towards a, a world building, let's say, um, uh, imaginary. Uh, and I think that's something that, that for me would be really uh, a part of uh, this new kind of, or this different kind of uh, history writing um, that we might call feminist or otherwise, uh, whatever, whatever it is. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question. Do we have another one from the audience? If not, I would like to add something to what Ross said. Um, I think that I keep going back to um, Saloni Mathur's book, um, The Migrant's Time, that the, this book that she edited, and one of the things she talks about in the introduction is the migrant's time in thinking about how time is experienced um, by the migrant, what it means to have to wait, what it means to have to arrive, but also the migrant's time, as in the time that we are in being the time of the migrant, that I think, you know, Ross, in a way, you're gesturing to just that um, we are in a moment of, um, you know, there are, of course, many analytics that one could use to think about histories, histories of the built environment, histories of, of things that we, um, that we think of as fixed. Um, and, but for, for me and Rachel, I think that this problematic of the archive was really so fundamental. Mm -hmm. And migration gave, really unlocked for us a way to start naming something that doesn't get named, that is truly normalized in, not just in architectural history, but I would say really across the board in the academy, uh, all these, institutions that are really built on stolen land and landed wealth, and in many ways are only just learning to name these things. But I think that because we had been living in the migrants' time, to think with Saloni for a minute, um, we really had been thinking about these things um, as fundamental to the ways we write histories. Now, whether that is thinking about history within the contemporary, I think that can also be debated, but I think it has been enormously generative for us. And um, I, I mean, I have to say, I was so moved, Atia, by your point about how these are things that fall on the backs of migrant mothers. I mean, of, uh, there are many things that you can, you can say, but I think that that really rang true for me that we find these hidden figures in all these histories. And I think every history we've heard about tonight um, tells this story in different ways. And I think that maybe to not normalize those things is a way that we wanted to begin um, calling out in the way we started naming archives. Um, we, uh, you know, I work very closely with, um, I think uh, I've learned so much from um, SE's process because I work very closely with um, a book written by Minette De Silva that she calls My Archives. And I spent uh, many years wondering why is this architect publishing something that she has to call My Archives? What is it that she's so self-consciously constructing there? And I think this also was this, um, this problematic that we found that if we could just unlock this way of understanding that the things we think are fixed are actually very mobile, and that the things that we assume are landed are actually made by migrants. Those were things that we felt could give us some purchase on, just ways to see differently and ways to really imagine differently. So um, we owe a great debt to all these authors who were willing to collaborate with us on what didn't sound like it made very much sense back when we were saying it some years ago, but has seemed to have gained steam over time. And, um, and these editors too, who, who really took it seriously. So maybe I'm trying to, I don't need to have the last word, but maybe I wanted yeah, to I sneak that in. I think that's a beautiful in. way to wrap up, <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you all for your incredible presentations and insights. It's just been really meaningful. And thank you all for coming. And Happy New Year. <laughs>